Good afternoon, brethren. I very much appreciate the uh, topic of our renewal this year. I think that this really is a good question that we ought to be able to ask ourselves is what is the relevance of this to me when we're reading the scriptures? Because we ought not to assume that there's anything in the scripture that does not apply to us. Uh, there is no such thing as truth uh, in the sense that the scripture speaks of it, the truth of God that is irrelevant or impractical. Um, just consider what we're talking about here. We're talking about the word of God, a word that has been passed down and preserved throughout the ages so that we could have it available in our hands in a language that we can understand. Just that very fact ought to provoke us to, to diligent search of it. And we are talking about the word of God. From the perspective of a created being, there is nothing that our creator could say that is not important for us to know. God doesn't say anything that's inconsequential, so to speak. You know, there's a lot of talk in our day about trying to make the gospel relevant to our generation. And, and there's, there's a whole movement of people in our day, a whole denomination of so-called churches, who they've actually they made this their mission to tailor the gospel to better affect our present generation. And in doing so, they have, create, they have committed a great iniquity. As our brother Given reminded us in our introduction this morning, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is. Now, so we're not, we're not trying to make it relevant. We're telling you why it is relevant. See, it, it needs no human amendment. It does its work. If preached without being adulterated by the opinions of men, the gospel will do what it is intended to do. And it's this very thing that we're confident of this week as we come together, that it is powerful and it is relevant. And it's, it's actually the most important thing that we could be directing our attention to today. So with that being said, our, our text is in 2 Timothy uh, verse 10. And I want to read verse 9 too. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now in our text, to start off with, it is affirmed that it's always been the intention of God to call a people unto himself. That this calling was something that was predestined before the world even began. It was a desire of his from even the foundation of the world to, to make a people for himself. Make a people who would be able to understand him, to be able to see him for who he was. And a people that he could dwell in, a people that he could, he could draw near to. However, the creation of this people, this is of su a work of such a magnitude that it's not something that can happen overnight. Uh, this is one that re required a lot of groundwork, so to speak. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of um, Hebrews in the first chapter when he says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the Father by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken us unto, his, unto us by his Son. See, God was not silent for the many years men lived on the earth before Christ came. He spoke, and he spoke, he spoke many times. And uh, these words came over the century through, through varied circumstance and, and through a diverse group of individuals. See, mankind, they actually had to be groomed over this, this period of thousands of years to be, able, to be able to have enough of a background or an outline to be able to, to properly receive the Savior when he comes. See, that, that's the magnitude of this work now, that it took this long to be able to, to build up to it. And uh, this is the way Paul said it in, in Titus. He said, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Again, this, is, this was his determination. But he hath in due times manifested his word through peach, preaching. So it took, it took some time before this due time um, came to pass. See, God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, and he, he told them something. He told them of a promise of this, this coming seed that was bruised the, the serpent's head. God spoke to Noah, and he, he showed him something as well. He showed him the judgment and the execution of wrath upon the wickedness of mankind. And, and uh, 
continuing, God spoke to Abraham, and he, see, he began to reveal this to him now, somewhat of his purpose to, to call out a people for himself, to separate a people. And, and God spoke to Moses and at sundry times. This, this is what we're seeing here. Moses, out of the burning bush, and he spoke to him about bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So the, the, the purpose was, was progressing. That he appeared to some in a vision or in a dream. He spoke to others audibly. Some had an angel appear to them. And some um, were moved by his spirit to write to the people. But however it came, it was like an outline of, of divine initiative that had been planned in the halls of eternity. Yet it was only able to have a very limited, illuminating effect upon humanity. Is that the revelation was not the heart of the matter, but it was like introductory in nature paving the way for this, for this appearance of Jesus Christ. See, the minds of men, they're really able to think so far with their finite capacities of reasoning and discernment. For the, for the full import of these plans, for, the, for the, the blueprints of it, so to speak, to, to register upon the human spirit, it required that men's be illuminated, that their, their minds be renewed. And this is something that had to be revealed by God if it was going to be seen. It had to be made manifest. But now, in our text this morning, this is what we're talking about. The time when it, now it is made manifest. It was not clear, but now because of the intentional initiative of God, it has been opened up so that we can understand it. So, so we, uh, we need to seek after this then. If it's understandable, then, then it's our business to know it. So it was made manifest by his appearing. Uh, Jesus Christ himself, God made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, uh, the, the word, the one who was with God and was God, a member of the Godhead himself, stepped down from the eternal realm to appear on our behalf. He appeared. And uh, even, even from the very beginning of, of Christ's appearance in the world, it's, it's almost like the angelic hosts just couldn't help themselves. They had to burst out into this, this jubilation. And suddenly there was a, with the angel the multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. See, this, in, it, in his appearing, this is what was, was happening. His good and his perfect will was being accomplished. And, and even more than that, it, it was toward men. This is good news. And when it came the appointed time for Christ to be able to begin his ministry on the earth, his manner among men, the things that he said and did pointed towards this purpose. He, he, show, he showed his compassion and his mercy upon the multitudes. And he, he, healed, he healed the sick and he cast out devils. And, and in this we're even able to see something. that he, he showed that God was on the initiative to remedy the ailment of humanity. That he wasn't content for his people to remain spiritually lame, blind, and sickly. That those who would seek him for this remedy would not be turned away. Amen. And this is what um, it says in Matthew chapter 4. This is the, as soon as he starts his ministry here. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, he, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. By the words that he said, he introduced this divine agenda to men in a clarity that it had never been before. Uh, he, he called his disciples unto them, and he, he taught them the mysteries of the kingdom. He said, yeah, it's, it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Even that, that would, that's a joyous thing if you think about that. There's prophets of old and men who wanted to know. They wanted to know. And he told the apostles, it's given you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Amen. So even early in his ministry, there was, there was another man that came up to him. And he, he sensed this in Jesus, that he could ask him this question. And uh, this is actually the first time this phrase, eternal life, is, is found in the Gospels. It's when this man came to him and said, one, one came, said unto him, and said, Good master, what thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So he saw this in Jesus, that he was able to answer this question for him. And when Jesus taught in the synagogue, those who heard him, they said, they marveled at the manner of his teachings. He talks like he's got authority. He doesn't talk like the scribes and the Pharisees. 
And uh, whenever many began to turn away from him because he, of the hardness of his saying that, that he told them they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, you remember there were some that began to depart from him. And Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? But you remember, you remember what Simon Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, they saw this. Jesus was uh, opening this up. He, he spake often of this, of eternal life. He told them in John chapter 3, And just as the Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This was good news. And John, uh, in John 17, uh, we remember in his, his prayer that he had there in the garden in his passion, those words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and fought, said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son might also glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give e eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he hath sent. See, that was, that was clear. It was clearer than it ever had been before. And this is, this is the reason why the apostle started his first epistle this way. When he, and John, when he said, and this is the record. See, this is his summary of, of what he learned here, that God has given us to us eternal life. And that, that life is in his son. It's in Jesus. So they, they saw these things and they heard them and, and that they might be faithful witnesses to all mankind of the gospel of God. So G, see, Jesus appeared and this was made manifest. And continuing on, speaking of Jesus, who hath abolished death. Now there are two aspects of this which I want to look at. Firstly, in his death and his resurrection, Jesus paid for sin and he overcame death. He, so in, in doing so, he removed its power over men. See, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden on that day, they died spiritually to God. They really did. When he said, on that day you shall surely die, they died spiritually to God. And from then on, they were cursed with a separation from God, which they themselves could not remedy. Uh, every man is born into this bondage. We've all had this experience. Everyone is born spiritually separated from their God. Now, part of Jesus abolishing death is the removal of this separation. Or, or more specifically, the cause of the separation is sin. So presently, we can see the effects of this triumph over death and that spiritually we have a way of escape from the law of sin and death. From the sin principle that's at work within all of us, we, we don't have to live according to that anymore because he, he overcame death. He abolished it. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. We can all say that today because he, he abolished death. And in uh, Romans 6 verses 8 through 10, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. See, death has no dominion over him. So when we talk about destroying death, I'm, uh, I'm always reminded of Hebrews, the second chapter, whenever it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. Now this, this is something that's always been a, a glorious consideration to me, that not only did Christ destroy the devil, but he did so in the weakest hour of his human life. After already having stepped down an unimaginable um, distance from the throne room itself to be combined in a body of his own creation, in the weakest hour of that human life, he destroyed the devil. And, and even furthermore, this is like uh, the ultimate um, divine irony, so to speak. He destroyed the devil with his own weapon. He used his own weapon against him. <laughs> I'm, I'm always reminded of, of David and Goliath whenever I think about this. It, after David had, had hit him with that stone and put him on the ground, how, how did he kill him? He got his own sword and, and, and killed him with it. That's, that's basically like what happened here. He used his own sword and, and killed him with it. Um, have you not experienced this, brethren, when, whenever we're talking about the destruction of death here, that when the wicked one comes to you to, to tempt you, to draw you away with your own lust and entice you, that you're actually able to say no? 
Uh, and you actually can find that there's really not any appeal for that thing which he's brought. Why, did the, why has this happened? This is actually possible. In, in fact, n- newness of life is designed this way, where you can actually be holy as he is holy. You can do that. So that when the wicked one comes to you and attempts an accusation, it won't stick. That uh, although you have this principle of sin within you, this, this nature of death that's associated with your body, that it would resonate with the temptation if you allowed it to, you can actually say this now, not I, but sin that dwelleth in me. Well, they're able to make that separation because Jesus, he overcame death. So as you are in Christ, as you are buried into his death, you're dead to yourself as well. You're dead to, to, to sin. Now, this is essential to the success of a believer in, the, in their sanctification, that you can recognize that when you are tempted, that it's not you. Uh, if, if the devil can get you to own your flesh, so to speak, if, if he will bring you into domination, if the, in that hour you can remember, I'm crucified with Christ. I, I've been a partaker of the circumcision of Christ. That may be in the house, but I don't have to put my foot in it. It's not me but sin that dwelleth in me. See, death no longer has any dominion over you in Christ. Now, this is a very practical truth. See, Jesus being raised from the dead is not a footnote on Easter Sunday. It it has very real and very powerful implications. So so much so that in in 1 Corinthians, he tells you, if Christ be not raised, then, then your faith is vain and you're yet in your sins. Now, as it concerns our text today, when he abolished death in the way that it's stated in our text, um, we have not seen this entirely in the respect to the death of our mortal bodies in the present. Uh, Men still have an appointment to die. Our, Our bodies are suffering corruption per the curse that God mandated upon the creation post fall. However, even though people in the present are still dying, there there is not an escape from mortal death. Its end has already been determined. See, this is the second perspective of this I want to look at, is that what Jesus did in destroying death, although we can't see the full import of it, in in the present it's like set in motion a turn of events that can't be annulled. And I want to thank Brother Given for his sermon this last Sunday. He said a lot of things that were like confirming to what I was talking about today. Here in 1 Corinthians, this is, this is the promise that we're talking about here. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Amen. Now, we are preparing ourselves uh, today for this eventuality by culturing ourselves to inhabit a body that's incorruptible. Uh, by being made partakers of the divine nature and putting off the old man, and, and uh, uh, we are disassociated from our bodies so that death for the sane is actually uh, more of a blessing than anything else. It's a passing into rest while we await the fulfillment of this abolition of death. So we recognize that this vile body, it's even now in the throes of death. We all experience this, that our bodies are dying. We can have hope in the truth that there's going to be a day that we, won't, we will no longer have this body. If this is the case, then we ought not to live as if we will. See, carnal men, they spend a whole lot of their lives trying to prolong the inevitable. I mean, how much money have, we, have, have people spent on anti-wrinkle cream? Well, guess what? You're going to wrinkle. You're going to die. There's not anything you can get away. You can't get away from that. And, um, they spend entire lifetimes seeking after pleasures that can only be fulfilled in a body of flesh. And uh, on that day when Jesus returns in his glory and all men are raised from their graves to ask to answer for the deeds done in the body, and they find themselves suddenly in an incorruptible body, they will not be comfortable, to say the least. That's putting it mildly. Now, I was thinking about this, and I was reminded whenever Peter was talking about his uh, Christ's coming, and he he described it as him coming as a thief in the night. Now, this will definitely be true for those who are not expecting him. Not only will they have everything that they hold dear robbed from them in an instant, they will actually be forced to live in a body that is forever incapable of fulfilling the lusts that they have loved so dearly. 
So he has, he has abolished death, and he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, this is something that mankind has always groped with, and that's about all they can do with it, is grope with it. Something that's been a mystery throughout the ages. What happens when we die? You know, what, what, what is beyond this world? And even the, the greatest philosophers in history who had a whole lot of say to, about everything else, uh, they, they were virtually speechless, speechless at the subject of death. Uh, they, they re, even they sur- realized that anything that they surmised, it was like only conjecture. There's, I mean, w- we can say a few things about what it might be like, but we admit that we don't know. And uh, this, in the scripture, men had a sense that there had to be something beyond this world. Life as it ex- exists beyond our current experience in the world was not really something addressed with any kind of clarity prior to Christ coming into the world. But holy men who were close to God, they, act, they did testify on several occasions of a resurrection that was going to take place. Um, Job, in the 14th chapter, he's talking uh, about this, and he... He says a plant dies, and when it, when it goes into the ground, it's, it's dead, but at the scent of water, it'll, it'll like spring up. And he says, um, if a man die, will he, will he rise again? So he's, he's kind of reasoning this out in himself. He said, if that's true of a plant, we know, we know that, then how, how, can men, how can that be true with men? He says, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. They will have a desire to the work of thine hands. And in the 19th chapter, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, as he had this sense, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. And in the 12th chapter of Daniel, and this is um, very close to, to what Jesus said concerning the resurrection, and many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And you know, I never really thought about it this way before, but we know that people in the time of Christ had read these things. They knew that these were in the scripture because there were a whole sect of religious people who were divided over this very thing. See, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, those are the, that, they're the ones who posed that question to Jesus about the woman with seven husbands. You know, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And uh, um, whenever Paul... Um, was before the council, he, perce- he perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees. So he said, I, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead am I called in question. And that, that's what divided them over that. That'd be kind of like going into an um, assembly today and saying, well, I'm called into question about the election of God. That might d- divide the people a little bit. In the <laughs> so even back then, there was, there, was, there was earthly division over Scripture, you know. Um, above and beyond just uh, existence beyond the grave, whenever we talk about life within the context of eternal or immortal, this is a concept that is not really expounded prior to the entrance of Christ into the world. The few times which the word appears um, that references anything eternal is almost exclusively in reference to God. The psalm says, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God, and thy throne is from everlasting. The Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. There were several times that he referred to the covenant as the everlasting covenant, but that was the saying that this is a covenant that God made with them. That men would have life that could be described as eternal was simply not revealed. And even all the wisdom given to Solomon, it was just under the sun, so to speak. As wise as he was, he didn't have any wisdom concerning this. However, what once was shadow and mystery, you see, Jesus has brought it to light. He's uncovered the mystery of it. Not of just life everlasting or life beyond this world, but of the, the quality of the life, of eternal life. The life of God. Not just forever the life, the, the air that fills our nostrils. Jesus talked about eternal life. Um, he was the only man who, who has ever lived who had life within himself. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. um, In the present, it can't really be said that we have life. Um, It's it's not really a possession that we can hold on to. It's it's here today and it could be gone tomorrow. It's, It's our mortal life isn't certain in any sense of the word. 
It might sound kind of odd whenever Jesus came and he said, I am come that they might have life. After all, he was, he was talking to people who were alive, right? People who were breathing and, and standing before them, but they didn't have life. Not, not in the sense in which he was referring to it. Not real life, not spiritual life. They were, they were dead, um, regardless of how it may it seemed in the flesh. Uh, Jesus spoke about this whenever he was on the earth. As it concerns immortality and life, um, he opened up this way of life whenever he was he's raised for the dead. Now, when he was on the earth, he, he, he spoke of it, and he, he became more specific about this, that he was the way, that he was the truth, and he was the life. And uh, in John 11, you remember whenever um, uh, Lazarus was dead, and he, he, um, Jesus told her that, that he'll, he'll, he'll rise up, he'll live again. And she's, I know that he'll, he'll rise up again in the resurrection, and he, it's almost like he's saying, no, you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the resurrection and the life. Believest thou this? Oh, that's the question. Do you believe this? Do you believe that in the God who raises the dead, in, in the Savior who is the resurrection? Uh, as, if, if, do you know that you have eternal life this morning? Now, I had this experience at work a few weeks ago when somebody had said something about what they did last weekend, and it was something wicked that I didn't even want to think about. And so I told him, well, that's not something that I want to have to answer for at the judgment. And uh, he said, well, you know, I figure that she only lived once. And so I replied, well, that may be true for you, but it's not for me. And, of course, he got... He got this puzzled look and he said, what's that supposed to mean? I said, well, I have eternal life. I'm never going to die. And so he just kind of chuckled at that. Yeah, we'll see about that. I said, well, my body's going to die, but I won't. I said, and guess what? You're going to die twice. <laughs> I think he probably thought I was a little bit crazy. But uh, as I was thinking about it later that day, I thought, you know, we ought to make a new phrase. People are always saying, well, you only, die, you only live once. Uh, you can tell this to your brother when they're on their deathbed. You can lean over and tell them, brother, you only die once. <laughs> That's good news. So whenever, whenever Jesus spoke to his followers about this eternal life, he, he began to open this up and uh, unpack what had been hinted at um, in God separating himself a people for his own, his own in the nation of Israel. This is like a, a foreshadow of this. And what was spoke by the prophets concerning this new covenant and this is the manner of the covenant. But this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they won't teach no, anymore, and every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they'll all know me, from the least to the greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity." See, um, God wants a people for his own that he can fellowship with. A people who will know him and a people who will be his people. Who, a people who wants what he wants. A people who loves what he loves. That he can, he can really have intimate fellowship with. And this is, this is uh, like after um, post-cross, the, the opening up, unpacking of that statement. Even the mystery which has been headed from ages and from generations, but now made manifest to his saints, whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The, the, the truth that men are actually going to be joined to the Lord in nature and in mind. There's not going to be that separation between him and his people anymore. There's not going to be a veil anymore. Now, the, the vehicle through which this mist has been cleared, so to speak, it's, it's the, the subject of our renewal this year, the gospel. This is the reason why it has relevance to every generation, every culture, every age of man. It doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, where you live, what language you speak, because it provides clarity concerning the nature of our life. This is something that all men have in common. All men are, uh, are spiritually dead. All men need life. And, and, and it, the gospel shows the path to life everlasting.
Now, the gospel does answer these age-old questions. It testifies not only of the appearing of Christ and what he did when he was here, but of the implications of it. Well, what did it really mean for Jesus to die and Jesus to rise again? You know, you hear that a lot whenever you ask somebody, what's the gospel? Well, the gospel is that Jesus died and he rose again. Well, I mean, that's true, but that's, that's a summary. Well, you, you, you want to get, get more than that. Now, what Jesus is doing now on the behalf of those for whom he died, um, that, that's part of it. Now, as the apostles were empowered by the Spirit to be able to call to remembrance the things that, that, he, that they saw, the things that they saw Jesus do in the earth, and, and the real significance of his death and his resurrection, the message was preached. The, the good news of what has come, a new and a living way. Now, I wanted to uh, demonstrate this here. Um, Jesus is saying um, the words of Christ when he taught, they're like kernels of untruth that have to be unpacked. There's, there's a lot there, and that's what the, uh, um, um, they did in the epistles. And John in the sixth chapter, this, this statement I talked about earlier that so many people balked at, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, the, the apostle didn't have a whole lot of problem with this teaching when he testified to the Hebrew brethren, and he told them, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. See, unless you partake of this, unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you by a new and a living way. See, he, he un, unpacked this. And... Uh, um, in Luke chapter 9, this is what Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall lose his life for my, save his life for my sake shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. And uh, in Romans 6, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were crucified with Christ. And this is, this is something that has to, has to continue. It has to be maintained. So eternal life is to know Jesus in a way that nobody else in the flesh can. To, to be buried into his death. To die with Christ. And to be raised with the very resurrection life of Christ himself. Um, the end of this thing, looking forward, that so much will we have been joined to the Lord on that day when the Lord presents us a spotless bride a church without spot or wrinkle, that will actually be in aggregate a perfect image of Christ. We will actually be a habitation that's suitable for God to dwell in for eternity. Now, in conclusion, brethren, I'm, I'm thankful that we have a God that raises the dead. That's, that's something that I'm thank, I was thankful to be able to see that more fully. I'm, I'm thankful for the message of the gospel and for the opportunity that we've been given to be able to, to look at these things in more detail. I've, I've been very edified by the things that the brethren have said, and I'm, I look forward to this to continue throughout the rest of the week. Thank you, brethren.